This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays. And if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, type in Old Dog, spelled D-A-W-G, find our podcast and subscribe. Well, we have a great show for you today. Uh, we have a young woman who is just kicking it in real estate and has just expanded out as she not only she is she just uh, you know real successful in the real estate reign, but she's also very involved in just a, a lot of good efforts in many different areas. So uh, quite an entrepreneur. Her name is Michelle Bosch, and she is the co-founder of Orbit Investments and a full-time real estate investor since 2002. She has bought and sold over 4,000 pieces of real estate and built the third largest land investment and auction company in the U.S., bringing that company successfully into the eight-figure revenues in a matter of 18 months. Through the recession, she positioned Orbit Investments for rapid growth in the single-family and multifamily investment space with over $40 million in assets under management. She's also the creator of the nationally recognized Land Profit Generator Program, focusing on teaching others how to invest in land, and has created over 145,000 followers via the Forever Cash podcast slash radio show uh, the, at the landprofitgenerator.com and ultimateboardroom.com and social media channels. Her business has been, or her businesses, should I say, have been featured on Inc., Fox, NBC, ABC, and Forbes, and she holds an MBA uh, business in business finance from Thunderbird Global School of International Management. Wow, what an accomplishment! <laughs> you have you have done quite a bit, Michelle, here in a very short period of time. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. I know it sounds like like a lot, but I'm just a very, in my mind, a very simple lady that has embraced the you know the workhorse to become a unicorn type of thing. <laughs> so a very simple gal, just not not scared of hard work and um, willing, you know, to put herself out there, pretty much. Oh well, it's it's really great. I also understand too that you know your husband also works alongside you, and uh, you guys are both very very uh, accomplished in in the real estate area. Thank you. Yes, it definitely is a team sport. Um, we, I couldn't do what we have, you know, been able to accomplish, and and you know, without him, it's it's been a very complementary um, journey of skill sets, of of interest, but same intensity, passion, drive, and hunger, and I think that has been an un, unbeatable combination uh, for us. And um, yeah, we we both are immigrants into the U.S. Um, he's originally from Germany. I am originally from Honduras. And we came here, you know, back in 1995 for me, 1997 for him, uh, with 
pretty much nothing, you know, but a couple of suitcases to our name, but our heart full of dreams. I know it's a, it's not a very common dynamic of having, a, you know, the husband and wife duo. A lot of people say, you know, how in the world can you guys do it? And I think it's because of that, because we complement each other, very, you know, complementary skills, strengths, and um, that makes for a perfect whole. Oh, definitely. That's the best uh, partnerships there. We, and we yeah. have those skills and, and efforts uh, that maybe you don't possess, but he does. And they, you know, put it all together and man, you've got a winning combo there. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of our folks would just like to know a little bit more, you know, about you and, uh, you know, where you came from and how you even ended up in real estate. Could, could you just kind of give us your story, your background? Absolutely. So, like I said, I'm, I'm an immigrant into the U.S. Uh, from Honduras. Um, Honduras is a tiny little country in Central America. You know, it's a third world country. Um, I had the the privilege of being raised by a mother that um, believed in me. And um, even though culturally, you know, a lot of, you know, back in my times, you know, when I was growing up, you know, not a lot of people were willing to bank on, you know, on girls, but she did. She gave me the best education she could afford. And um, she raised me as a, as a single mom because my father passed away when I was very young. So it was just the two of us. And uh, he was an accomplished lawyer. And but it wasn't his profession what helped us back then, you know, kind of like overcome that loss uh, financially, you know, of not having an income. But it had been a uh, a financial or an investment decision that he had made a few years prior to passing away. He had purchased an investment property, and you know, producing rental income, passive cash flow, and that pretty much is what complemented my mother's elementary school teacher salary and allowed her and me, you know, to live, uh, you know, what would be considered here in the U.S. like a middle class life, in spite of being you know, surrounded in an environment that is um, extremely poor. Um, I was able to, you know, go to a private school, be able to learn English as a result of going to that private school, you know, because it was a bilingual school. And it, you know, it afforded me the opportunity to even be here and now talk to you and, you know, and communicate in English and so on and so forth. So um, even though, you know, there was this incredible big loss in my life, um, I, I feel like, uh, all in all, you know, uh, the cards that I've been dealt have been fantastic. And so I came here in 1995 to start my uh, bachelor's degree. Um, I came for a finance degree and uh, I came with a student visa. Um, I graduated and along with that student visa, you have a year of practical training, kind of like that, that you, where your visa allows you to work, you know, for a company here. Uh, the same for my husband. And so uh, we met in college and after, um, you know, a, a couple of semesters there, we decided, okay, let's give uh, this a go. Let's use our one year of practical training, you know, work permit that we have. Let's try to find jobs. Let's try to find companies that would be willing to sponsor our working visas once that one year was over. We both, you know, found, you know, found jobs that were able to do that for us. Um, and, and we pretty much did what, you know, what everyone says, you know, get, get a great education, uh, start a job. And, and after several years, we realized, you know, after being a hundred percent travel, you know, both of us that we absolutely hated, um, our jobs. And, um, and we knew that there's, there's gotta be a different way, you know, to, to be able to still, for example, have time to visit his family in Germany, visit my family back in Honduras, and um, and, and travel the world. And two weeks, you know, on our on our existing jobs back then weren't 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 gonna cut it. We could either go one year to Germany and, or Honduras, but not both. And and just the the travel and not seeing each other, you know, that really after. In the, in the beginning, it seems glamorous, but after you do it a little while, you realize, oh my gosh, this is, you know, I'm, is this what my day is gonna be like every day? And it starts becoming Groundhog Day. And, um, and we knew that we were destined for more. And I, you know, I had the experience of, of having had a, an investment, you know, um, really produce cash flow for us back home. But um, in spite of us having good jobs, you know, we had maybe three thirty five hundred dollars to our name in terms of savings and, and so on and so forth. You know, we were living paycheck to paycheck, just like, you know, like 
everyone else, in, in spite of the high job, you know, we had we had payments on our home, on our car, on our sofa, on my laundry machine. I mean, payments on everything, you know. So it, there wasn't a whole lot to have, you know, for for savings. So that's pretty much the extent of savings that we had. And we knew that we needed to do something different. We started looking at different uh, business opportunities. And uh, and for us, the main thing was we wanted something simple. We wanted something that produced a passive cash flow. Um, and, um, and, and and I knew, you know, from back home that real estate was, was a good vehicle, was a good avenue. I just didn't know how to go about it because you know, we didn't have any. We didn't have any credit. We didn't have big savings. Uh, we had no idea as far as constructions and repairs, how to estimate. Uh, you know, in Honduras, we we built for hurricanes. In Germany, they built for harsh, incredibly harsh uh, winter weather, and and so everything seemed, you know, uh, within the real estate in industry very complex for us back in you know back when we decided that we needed to do something real estate but we didn't know what and and we did look at houses but uh and 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 we put under contract i remember a junker out here in phoenix because that's where i live right now i've been here now 20 years and uh we were so scared it had foundation issues roofing issues all kinds of issues and after advertising it in the local newspaper you know for like a week we had no takers and we're like oh my gosh we need to get out of the contract while we can because you know while our due diligence experience is still in, in you know in place because uh, we 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 were too scared to you know think about us even doing a renovation you know we we're trying to flip that or wholesale that that deal because we didn't know what to do with it and then um and then somehow we stumbled into a concept here in the u.s that does not exist in either of our countries and that's a tax liens and tax deeds and so i remember attending an auction and i was completely baffled by number one the fact that somebody could lose their property to you know to being a delinquent in property taxes and uh and number two i was also incredibly like blown away uh, from the sense of uh, how incredibly competitive that that wasn't something new you know that that's something that has been going on here in this country for some time. Uh, the particular county that I actually went to, you know, experience this uh, was in Sonoma County, so Northern California. So needless to say, one con wine country is, so of course, incredibly competitive. It was like uh, being in a shark infested tank, you know, at the auction. But um, what I noticed was that there was quite a bit of property that was being sold there and that was going to auction that was vacant land. And um, and I actually was, you know, bidding on a piece of land, um, but it went way above what I wanted, you know, what I could afford to to buy it for. However, you know, I I met the owner of that property that was, you know, losing her property right there at the auction, and she told me, you know, I have this other property that I could, you know, that'd be interested in, in, in selling to you. And so I was able to get an option contract on that and, you know, find a buyer that was willing to uh, buy it for more than what I was, um, you know, buying it from her. I was buying it for like 75K and I found somebody to buy it for 100K. So it was like, you know, a, a spread of, of 25K there. And, and I know, oh my God, you know, I, I knew that I wasn't necessarily going to be able to find those because it was like perfect universe synchronicity, you know, being at the right place at the right moment, uh, talking to this lady. And, and I'm like, can I replicate? Can I build a, a business out of that? And, 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 and the answer was no. But what it occurred to me is that, or both of us, because Jack was there as well, what it occurred to us was that you know, if people are letting go of their, of their vacant land at, at auctions due to property taxes, they've made up that decision to let go of their land way before that. Because, um, you know, you have to be five plus years in certain counties here in the U.S. in order for that property to get to that level. So we're like, what if we got to those people earlier and, um, and contacted them directly and bought their pieces of land? And so we started with delinquent land lists from counties, pretty much. Um, and sending them direct mail, sending them a letter that now, you know, after 20 years has been, well, after six or seven years was completely perfected. 
um, and where we are able to get, you know, for every 750 to 1,000 letters that we send out, we get 10 to 15 responses, one to three deals, and the typical flip on those uh, on those properties is anywhere between $5,000 and $15,000. And of course, you come across those beautiful jewels, you know, where you can. Uh, make larger spreads than that in the 30, 50, and even $100,000. But, um, but, but I basically I don't build my business on, on those that occasionally come, but on the ones that are those, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 flips that I know I can find uh, in my sleep day in and day out. And, um, and, and so, yeah, so for us, land was was something that had very little competition. You know, whenever you know we would reach out to people, and we continue to reach out to people, uh, they've never they've never been approached by anyone. You know, if you if you were to talk to a house um, wholesaler or someone doing you know housing, trying to flip houses and find houses, uh, what you would find you know the typical you know response when I you know when I visit here with my local RIA, you know other investors is that. There's an incredible amount of competition, and for every one letter that they send, you know that same uh, owner of that property has received 15, 20 other competing letters and offers, you know, to buy their property. And you have to run down there in the moment that you do get, you know, a uh, a seller to say yes, I'm interested in selling it to you, and, and negotiate a price right away, and so on. So it requires a lot of negotiation skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We do everything pretty much by mail. Um, I, you know, when I said that we're a little bit, uh, you know, complimentary, you know, I'm naturally uh, an introvert. And so I love the fact that I can do everything by mail, that I can be on the phone, that it's that I'm not cold, you know, uh, cold calling or, you know, creating a lead uh, by having to cold call someone. But I send them a letter. They respond either by email or by phone um, and I can research their property pretty much without talking to anyone, I can make an offer, I can send the offer, you know, a contract, um, also by mail, get an offer accepted, open escrow with a title company, you know, in the meantime, Jack finds a buyer, he's the talker, he's, the, you know, he's the outgoing he's one. He's the extrovert. <laughs> yeah, he's the extrovert for sure. Finds a, a wonderful home for that piece of land and we relieve someone of the burden of property ownership, you know, someone that either because of divorce, time and circumstances, or um, they've inherited the property or they're an out-of-state home, you know, uh, owner, or simply they at some point decided that they wanted to uh, retire, you know, out from the northern states of the United States down to the south, and they bought two pieces of land, maybe one here in Arizona, one in Florida. They decided to, you know, to go ahead and uh, retire in Florida. And now they have this vacant piece of land that they keep on paying property taxes for, but neither of their kids want. They they don't seem to, you know, be looking at doing anything with it, and they're willing to basically sell it to us for anywhere be between five and twenty-five cents on the dollar. And because uh, nobody nobody has approached them and nobody is there to, you know, to um, really help them solve the issue of being able to get rid of this property, you know, rather quickly um, like we do. And um, so. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of like the, the just of it over time, of course, you know, um, as we have improved in our sophistication. Um, as investors, and we were able to master, uh, you know, the land game, because um, because that's that's one thing, you know, we for for many 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 years that's land, and we continue to do land, but not exclusively now anymore. But for many years, that's exclusively the only thing that we did, and what it created was us having the ability to repeat and repeat and repeat and you know a cycle of buying and selling of buying and selling and and that repetition really creates mastery and with mastery the land flipping for us has become like a we have a phd in making money is how i feel about it you know you oh, talked sure. about my, my education there at the beginning you know and uh, believe me, I didn't get that PhD <laughs> at the university. It was being in the trenches, uh, you know, day in and day out for the last several years now um, doing that. And, and like I said, you know, and at some point we, we decided, OK, we want to start uh, moving some of, you know, the profits that we're able to create with and move them into houses. And and how that came about, Bill, was 
So when we sell our land, we're able to sell it in, in two ways. We can flip the land in two ways. We can either flip it for cash for a quick flip, you know, 10, 15, 20K. Um, and I can sell that usually very quickly because I'm selling at maybe 60, 70, or 80% of market value. But I'm making a good profit because I'm only buying for, you know, maybe 25 cents on the dollar. Um, so that's one way that I can flip it. The second way that I can flip it is that I, we usually, um, and this is something that we also stumbled into in the beginning, we were just trying to create, you know, cash profits until, you know, I had a piece of land here in Northern Arizona, 1.25 acres, and we were selling it for like $6,000. And somebody said, I don't have the $6,000, but I could give you a thousand dollars, you know, down right now. And I had only paid like 400 bucks for that property. Um, I can give you a, so I had my money back two times over when, you know, with a down payment, I can give you a down payment of a thousand and I could have, you know, uh, payments of maybe $200 every month for the next X amount of years. And so all of a sudden that was like ka-ching, oh my gosh, you know, I can sell it at full retail instead of, you know, at a discount, um, get a down payment, um, get monthly payments, get, you know, mailbox money every month. And 200 bucks might not seem like a lot, but when you bring in the ingredient of volume into the equation um, and you have, you know, 800 deals that you're doing, you know, seller financing and 800 loans at anywhere between two and five hundred dollars, then, you know, things can start to add up. And, you know, we were able to create about 12 million dollars in notes, 70 thousand dollars in passive cash flow just on doing seller financing deals on land that we were selling here across the southwest USA. Amazing. And, uh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> it uh, and um, and and so we we understood, you know, uh, the power of that monthly cash flow. But with the land, the per the moment the person pays off their piece of land, you know, that monthly cash flow stops. And we're like, how can we start rolling over some of that monthly cash flow and cash profits from the flips and start moving it into much more long term? Uh, you know, passive cash flow that we like to call here in our family, we call it forever cash because it's there forever. You know, I, it kind of like, you know, how it was with, for me when I was growing up with that one single, you know, investment property that my father had first away, you know, uh, bought and, and after he passed away was able to spit up ca cash flow pretty much forever to this day. My mother still owns that property and is, you know, and it'll probably continue to, you know, uh, supplement her income into her old age. And, and so, and so we're like, okay, how can we start passing some of those? And we started looking into single family homes and we were looking at it in, in a fantastic point in time. It was the bottom of the market, 2009 here in Arizona, and we could buy houses for 40, $50,000, you know, repair them for 10 and rent them and, uh, get 900 or $1,100 in rent. And so we built a nice size portfolio of single families. And then about five years ago, you know, we were like, okay, what's the next, what's the next thing that could really turbocharge this passive cash flow? And we started looking and getting into multifamily. And now we own, you know, in three markets, we have 360 units right now of larger apartment buildings. And, um, and, 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 but it, it started with something simple. It, so, it started with something that we could really get our hands around uh, that allowed us to continue having jobs because we couldn't just devote ourselves to this side hustle, you know, entirely. Because even if we want it, and even if the flips were creating enough, enough cash flow, we, we had to hold on to our jobs because our jobs were the tickets to our green card. So we kind of like, you know, uh, in the beginning, you know, with the land, we we couldn't just walk away from our jobs because our jobs are what would guarantee us, you know, the possibility to stay here in the U.S. Um, for the long haul and really call this home. Now, you know, Jack uh, became a U.S. citizen like three years ago. I became a U.S. citizen in 2008, a year after my daughter was born. And um, and this is, you know, Phoenix, Arizona is home now. I'm, 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 there's an area here called Paradise Valley. I'm in Paradise Valley looking into an area called Sunset Hills. And um, and this is where, you know, where I live. But at, at the cornerstone of everything that we have uh, built, not just in capabilities, in wealth, in assets, in cash flow, um, 
has been, you know, that incredible work ethic, the hunger, the drive, the not being scared of hard work and finding a model that was simple, that allowed us to continue having a job, um, you know, for, for the time being, because we needed it for our green card. Um, and, um, and that we could do remotely that we, like I said, I didn't have to talk to, to sellers. I didn't have to have amazing negotiation skills in order to put up, you know, a house under contract, um, with the land. Um, and, and that we were able to sell, you know, also pretty quickly because of the value that we're bringing into the marketplace by offering a property at substantially below market value. And, and so it's a win-win really, um, for everyone and, um, and, and, and now, you know, as, as, as we grew our, our family, we now have a 12 year old, um, you know, it's, it's continues to, to be a model that puts our family first, um, and that, uh, really allows us to, you know, spend quality time in, in the things that are essential for us. Of course, that's different for everyone, but, you know, family time for us is important and we absolutely love, love to travel. Um, we, you know, we travel a good, you know, 60 to 90 days out of every year, you know, uh, here and there. Now we're restricted to doing most of that travel only when Sophia is out of school. Although I did homeschool her, you know, for a year, um, back when she was in fourth grade. Um, and that was fantastic, but she's an only child. She needs to go back to school. She needs to, you know, make friends. And so it's been a model that has allowed us to really live now, um, you know, the four freedoms. If you think about it, everyone starts looking for something, you know, you know, a side hustle or whatever you want to call it, because they're looking, they're after freedom of, of time, number one freedom of money, you know, uh, freedom of relationships. If you work in an environment that is, you know, toxic or you hate the politics at work or whatever, and you want to be your own boss and, you know, being able to create your own team with people that align with you values wise and so on and so forth. It's allowed us to do that. Uh, but most importantly, it's allowed us to also now really live our freedom of purpose and now, um, really share this with others. I mean, land has been so cornerstone and transformational to us. And, um, and, and now that's, that's exactly what we're doing. We're sharing the same model with, with others as well. So we are, you know, we're, we're very excited, pumped about, you know, 2020 right now and, and, and what's come and, um, an amazing team, you know, of course, behind me and Jack, we're, we're not, you know, people might see us more out in the, you know, in the at front stage, but there's a whole lot of people behind us supporting us now to really support the three lines of business that we're in right now, you know, because we continue to flip land, but we have a portfolio of single family homes that we, you know, that we manage. Um, and now we have apartments as well that, that we manage and those we manage with the help of, you know, first class property management companies. Cause uh, we syndicate, that's like a much more of like a syndication model and, and, uh, in those, you know, three different markets. And, but we're still having to be, you know, asset managers and great stewards of other people's money and, and, and be on a weekly basis, checking in with property management on each of those, you know, properties, uh, to make sure that we're optimizing them and, and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and like I said, now, you know, we're sharing it with others. We've been sharing it with others now for, for 10 years. Um, it continues to be the exact, the exact same sweet model that it was for us when we started, uh, where we didn't have a team. It was simple. There was no competition. You know, there's low startup capital. You know, in terms of like uh, direct, you know, marketing dollars that you. Uh, need to, you know, allocate. Um, we're still getting the same type of deals uh, as far as spreads um, and, and and just conversion rates haven't, you know, haven't changed. There's some counties now that are a little bit more uh, where, you know, our conversion rate is a little lower. And, and that's because now with technology, you know, as more people um, are able to acquire a list of, you know, of a vacant property, they're, you know, when it was hard to acquire that list, it was less competition. Now there's some certain counties where, you know, they are publishing that list, you know, uh, of either delinquent properties or their assessors for, you know, $200 and you can easily buy it or just download it from their website. And with that ease comes, okay, if it's easy for me, it's easy for somebody else as well. But that's just a few couple, you know, counties in the country, uh, in the, especially in the Florida area, 
Um, and But we are still able to do deals in other counties in Florida and anywhere across, I would say, uh, we like to focus on, you know, the middle of the country and south just because it allows then Jack the opportunity to market those properties year round versus trying to sell a piece of land, you know, under however many feet of snow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of like the story. I know that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's well, that's a lot. I mean, it's, it's great because uh, I've got a million questions here for you. And okay. It's nice how you explained that your challenge, you know, the fact that you were new here to the country and you, you know, had an established credit, you didn't have a lot of the things in place and you found this niche where you didn't, weren't required to have necessarily, a, you know, credit or uh, even, even funds because you're the sort of the middle person, right? It's like wholesaling uh, with, you know, with, with homes, except you're doing it with land, which is fascinating. Just out of curiosity, you um, also talk about a, a land auction company that you have yeah. Uh, yeah how does that work in there so when we when we first started it was you know jack and i um and then we jumped on jack's green card application uh and i was then a um like a like a dependent and uh and i was finishing up my mba here and we're like okay you know i we're i'm you know you're you're for the sake of the you know of the permanent residency here you'll continue i will do this thing and i was able to get you know like 10 to 15 deals done that first year then um you know 60 deals then 100 deals then it was time for us to finally have our green card jack actually worked for an additional 10 months for the company after having the green card um, and, um, and I'm like the moment that he then jumped on board, you know, we were able to jump from like 60 deals to 120 deals. Cause now it was both of us, you know, doing this full time, but we hit a wall in that we were working our butts off, you know, with six and a half days a week. And, and we're like, okay, you know, in, in our third year in business, how, or our fourth year in business, how are we going to double that because we cannot unless we don't sleep you know we are not going to be able to accomplish it um so we we got a we got we hired two people that would come into my living room or you know park in our garage because we were living you know working out of our home um and um and we started getting their help but but still we were able to maybe take more take more calls um create more listings to sell online and so on and so forth but at the same time, you know, it, 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 in spite of having those two people helping us with a lot of the, you know, volume of inbound calls, you know, because I, you know, back then we didn't realize, oh my gosh, we could have outsourced those outbound calls to a call center. Um, it, it didn't occur to us, to be frank. I didn't know that that existed back then. <laughs> so we took sure. every single phone call. <laughs> Live and learn, right. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and, and so we're like, you know, even, even if we were to hire more people to, you know, to help us on the phone and talk to buyer and talk to, yeah, to buyers of the land, because contrary to, to the housing world, you know, people are talking a lot to the sellers in the housing world. I don't need to talk to a seller whatsoever, but we do want to talk to the buyers, you know, um, and uh, we're only going to be able to, you know, to sell X. And we're like, what, what do we need to do in order to, um, to be able to sell instead of 150 parcels a year, you know, how could we sell a thousand parcels a year? And that's when we came across this auction concept. And it was, um, a company out of LA that was auctioning houses. Actually, we went to that auction here. It was held at the Phoenix Convention Center, and we looked at ourselves and we're like, okay, if they're doing this with houses, we certainly can do this with land as well. You know, we 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 it was an, it was a big production, you know, and um and that's that's pretty much it wasn't it was an original thought, it wasn't our idea, it was somebody else's idea. This auction concept was already there. I had seen it already in action at the tax deed auctions, you know where everyone's bidding on, on the properties, but, um, but it, I kind of like lost sight of it and, and forgot about it. I thought that's something only the government can do, you know, or a county official can do. And when we saw this company doing it, we're like, okay, we're, we're doing it as well. I put on my big girl panties and went out there <laughs> shopping like crazy. You know, we built up an inventory of about 150 properties in less than four or five months. 
and we did our first auction and it was uh, amazing. I, you know, we went from, like I said, being able to sell 150 in a year to being able to sell 150 in one day. And wow. now it's like, oh my gosh, let's do that again. And, you know, and, and again and again, and let me, you know, build more team to help me buy more faster so that we can have 200, you know, parcel auctions once a quarter. And we did, we did do that for several years, especially in that run up, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to 2008. And we figured who knows how long this is going to last. So let's put the pedal to the metal and, um, and let's start doing that. And then, um, back in 2007 in the the last auction of 2007 we noticed that it was getting much more expensive for us to get butts in the seats you know at the auction and it was costing us more uh in in, in terms of getting the numbers that we needed in order to create that dynamics you know and that energy that is electrifying at an auction and um and we started becoming students of online marketing and we started you know learning a lot about online sales and now pretty much everything we do in terms of land sales is online do you do direct mail still we continue to do direct mail for the for the acquisition for okay. the acquisition and, and even though we've been testing right now also phone numbers and and, and like broadcast like using slide broadcast because i've i've been using broadcast like to to try to get uh, improve my acceptance rate by se sending second offers, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, if you haven't responded to my first offer. So I was using it, um, you know, like as, as a second, as a second level or second tier, but we've been experimenting with using that, you know, as uh, the, as the original communication. Uh, but to be frank, uh, the, 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 it, the conversions that we've been getting, that the, nothing beats that letter of somebody, you know, touching my wonderful, you know, uh, linen paper uh, in this beautiful, <laughs> super professional that doesn't look like junk mail, you know, that is addressed to you personally. Um, and, um, and, and, and then, you know, calling back in and saying, yes, I'm interested in, you know, somebody in my team. Uh, taking those calls and, and, and having a warm body there and creating that professional relationship from the get go um, so that, you know, so that your sellers know that, you know, you are for real, that this is not a scam, that this is um, actually something that, you know, that is going to happen. And, um, and on the buyer side, the same, you know, presenting yourself, you know, with a beautiful website, with beautiful listings, you know, because with land, contrary to houses where you can stage it, you don't have the benefit of that. So you need to be a little bit more creative in how you build your listings. And, but that's all, you know, things that now, you know, we, we, we share because we've been doing this for years. And like I said, we've been students of online marketing uh, now for years and we share, you know, with others that want to learn as well how to do this. Sure. Now, what would you say in this, uh, in just in this process that you've gone through from, you know, really starting off just, you know, a few chunks of land in the beginning and, and, you know, growing, what would you say sort of your biggest mistake that maybe you, you might've done early on that uh, you've learned from to, you know, just to, again, to, to refine and, and become more efficient at what you're doing? Yeah. So I, I, I think the biggest mistake has been uh, in order for us to grow, like I explained our growth, we had to develop a unique process. And, um, and I'm going to actually give you two mistakes, <laughs> a unique process. And in that unique process, if you follow it to the T, you're going to make money. If you start skipping steps, you're going to make mistakes. And I think at some point, um, because I'm in charge of acquisition, I may have gotten a little bit arrogant. Oh, I know this area very well, or, you know, so on and so forth and uh, didn't follow my own unique process in terms of like, you know, the due diligence once a contract comes in, you know, there's a period of, you know, due diligence where um, I wasn't as thorough as I should have been. And I bought pieces of land, for example, acre lots that were um, unbuildable because a, 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 there had been a change in zoning. And now in order for it to be buildable, it required two acre lot, you know, two one acre lots. And I was able to kind of like, in spite of my mistake, because I had a bought adjoining lots, I was able to group them together, you know what I mean? To bring in two adjoining lots so that I could sell them as a package of two so that whoever would buy it from me could actually build a home because we don't wanna, you know, just 
sell, you know, this is not junk plant that we're selling, you know? And I had overpaid slightly. I was still able to make a little bit of money, but you know, that was like a, I don't know if it was big, you know, big, but it, it really humbled me in that, oh my gosh, you know, I need to really follow my processes. That was one. And then the second one, I think, was because we had had a good education, you know, from 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 a good school, we, we were coming to this business with the thought of like, you know, processes, um, you know, the what, the how, the tactics, strategy, uh, and so on and so forth. And we, I think in the beginning, even though we had built a team, I had built a team where I had incredible amounts of turnaround, a lot of drama, HR drama, because I wasn't really focused on the pillar of the who. If you think about it, any business is built upon four pillars. That's the, the pillar of your why, you know, why are you doing this? The pillar of the who, you know, uh, who are you doing this for? Who is coming along in this ride? Who is your team? Who are you here to serve? Um, you know, and, and, and then your what, you know, what is it? What is the vehicle for us? It was land. And how are you going to do this? You know, there's those are the four pillars. And I was like, I knew why we were doing this, what and the how. And I knew that the who was important and that I was building a team, but I wasn't necessarily developing a team that was aligned with core values, that shared our values that was fully aligned in our vision and in our mission. And the moment that we did that, and I, and I know that I think it's probably because it's something that is hard to put a dollar amount where you can really see the effect on a p and um, that, you know, I just didn't put my focus there on the who. For the last seven to eight years, my, my, my focus has been whenever it's, you know, hiring uh, and building and developing our team has been that who and really building them up in confidence, you know, in, in mindset, in skill set, in capabilities. You know, uh, wh whenever I, I have uh, I have focus on the who, everything comes with ease. You know, it's not it's not hard. It's not you don't feel like you're ha constantly having to push um, anyone around. Um, and, and with those, with that alignment of values, you know, you magnetize business, you know, we, we have, you know, sellers that say, you know, I did get, you know, occasionally, like I said, in those counties, a couple of other offers, but I'm deciding to work with you because they're being magnetized by those core values that our business, you know, operates within now. And so I would say that, yeah, I, I had a lot of headaches. I wasted a lot of money, a lot of time in training and team that just did not fit. And, um, and I think that's the biggest aha has been at the end of the day, a business is made out of people, you know? Mm, that's great. Yeah. So I think that answers my second question already that, you know, your biggest success was, uh, yeah. you know, really focusing in on the who, uh, which is really a key, key yeah. point. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, when you have a problem, it's not a check that will solve it. Well, even though if you have a termite problem, a check could solve it, but, <laughs> yeah, right. but, but everything it's, it's not about how. You know, and, and even like now, you know, we're learning something new, you know, for this year and we it, it, it's not the how is who do I know that I that I can be resourceful and, and, and that I can ask questions and that can help me out. You know, e even when you're having a, you know, a, a difficulty, a challenge, an obstacle, uh, sometimes it's not so much the strategy to get out of it be, because you might not have it, but there will definitely be a who that has the answer to what you're trying, to the riddle that you're trying to solve. I love it. I love it. But I did want to ask you real quick here um, in terms of um, advice uh, for, you know, those that are listening that are, you know, our audience are people that are, you know, 50 years of age and, and older. Uh, some of them, you know, are still working and, and uh, are maybe approaching retirement, preparing for retirement. And then there are those that are in retirement and they're looking for ways to generate additional cash flow. And, and you know, and, and sort of is you know, concise uh, uh, explanation as you can, what advice would you have for those folks in terms of, you know, what you've done and, and what maybe they could learn from that and, and help themselves in their retirement years? Yeah. So, so, so yeah, uh, I would say uh, find a, a, a way to simply um, create passive cash flow. You don't have to be a, um, you know, a master of a hundred different stocks uh, there, there's other avenues out there, um, especially in real estate. It's the perfect vehicle, in my opinion. Find a model that is simple, 
um, that you know that has that has you know little competition that you can really wrap your 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 you know your mind your skill set around. Um, and, um, and and yeah, that, that really aligns with 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 who you're, who you are, where you're at, and um, and that can still produce the results that you needed to produce. Um, of course, I'm going to say because I'm biased that land, <laughs> land is a perfect vehicle, you know, uh, because because it is. You know, we just right now we have an amazing uh, Facebook community called the Land Profit Generator Real Estate Community. Um, and just now, you know, a couple weeks ago, Bamzi and her husband, Steve, they're both, uh, I would say Bamzi is in her mid 40s and Steve in his mid 50s. And Steve just retired from a job that he hated, you know, uh, and um, and that that was 18 months after starting, you know, flipping land. And then Bamsi's next. Bamsi is the next one that will be freed up. And it's because it's something simple that doesn't require, you know, all the technology uh, that you be a technology, uh, you know, uh, God's uh, gift to technology. There's so many things that can be outsourced because of the simplicity of the model. Um, and, 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 and yeah, and, and it works. So I, I, I'd say, you know, because I was able to retire myself already so many years out, I wanted to bring, you know, the example of Steve and Bamsi, they just did it. And that's only 18 months after starting, you know, God, so that's, and it's something that's that aligned neat. with them, that didn't require them to, you know, to completely, uh, you know, learn how to put up a website and, and so on and so forth. And, and of course, you know, there's, you know, over the years now that we've been we've been sharing this with others, we've we've developed and user friendly. You know, for specifically, you know, a demographic that may not have, you know, grown up with it. My my husband, I mean, Jack is also he's going to be turning fifty this year in May, and so um, you know, I'm I'm a little younger than that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But uh, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't require. It, it's it's something because because at its core the model is so simple it doesn't it doesn't require that you know you have the super fancy stuff that that you cannot even operate or figure out how to operate um, in order to make money and, and do deals and to be frank uh, you really don't need it because we've been doing deals from before we had that software way basically that pro work walks you through the entire process from beginning to end, from, you know, the acquiring of a list to all the way to selling your property. And actually now, even if you do seller financing, even, uh, you know, keeping track of your loans on that same stuff are all incredibly super uh, user friendly and, and intuitive. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, at the end, at the end of this, we'll be able to give a link to, uh, yeah. you know, to how people can find out about that. Well, we're, yeah. we've kind of moved up to what we call our wrap it up session right now. And this is uh, where I ask you a series of quick questions and you give me quick responses to, as a means to share resources that have been of value to you and that our listeners can learn from as well. So if you're ready, we can go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. All right. First question. Favorite real estate book? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm, um, I, I yes. know that it's probably a, um, you know, a, a horse that has been beat to death. My favorite too. <laughs> Definitely. Think, think different about assets and yeah. And uh, how about just favorite general business book? The general uh, business book has been The Pumpkin Plan. Oh, that's a great one. Yes. By Michael Michalowicz, uh, and that has been also incredibly instrumental to us because, you know, as you start in business and start investing and there are so many things out there that you can be throwing your energy at and it can almost become an octopus. But you need to remember that if you're feeding all of those things with your energy and your space, you're really not able to produce amazing results because you don't you don't focus, you know, and exactly. so that book pretty much talks about a premise of like, you know, uh, the, the pumpkin plant, the pumpkins that, that farmers grow for, for prices and how they basically prune on everything else and let go of everything else of the smaller ones in order for all the nutrients and all the stuff to go to that one big pumpkin, you know? Mm, and um, and it, it's, it's been, yeah, it's been great for us to, to focus, to simplify, always to be on a on a quest for simplification because simplification add added at that is also a cornerstone of prosperity of being able to multiply 
when you when you when you do and develop things simply you know yes uh, how about most valuable website for success a website called theartofliving.org i have been now a uh, pra- you know been practicing meditation uh, for almost 11 years and i love going there it's a great resource um, to go, you know, find meditations and uh, events, you know, where I can, you know, go and meditate with other people that are doing and following the same technique. And, and it's just uh, my, uh, yeah, it's, it, they have like little drops of, uh, of wisdom every day. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good website. I know it's, it's not business related. It's, it's, it might not no, be true, conventional, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been great. How about favorite app? My favorite app, uh, especially as of January 1st, my fitness call. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. My fitness call and I'm back on my fitness call and um, basically logging in my food, really take care of my, you know, my, my health. Um, that is really the, the, you know, your first wealth. And uh, we seldom forget that a win in that category of our lives, you know, in our health and fitness is really a win in all categories. Um, and uh, cause without that, you, you can't go out there and be, you know, uh, vibrant, exuding vitality, energized. You know, if, if you are operating out of a sick body and a sick body will probably sometimes produce a sick mind, you know? So I'm trying to go at both my mind, cultivate my mind, cultivate my body. And so I would say my fitness fall. Sure, favorite quote. I have two. One is, you know, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and it's the man in the arena. And a second one, you know, from a lady, Maya Angelou, and I'm going to quote her. If you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. Uh, Don't try to do what everyone else is doing. Um, Be brave. Stand, you know, for something different. Be a contrarian. We've always been contrarians. You know, when everyone was selling here in Phoenix their houses, we were buying them for pennies on the dollar. When everyone's running after, you know, houses, we're running after lands. Last question. Let's say you lost everything and all you have is a thousand dollars in cash. Mm-hmm. What would you do with that thousand dollars to rebuild your real estate investing business? And you only have like one sentence to answer. Here. Mm-hmm. I would uh, go back to land and um, basically I know a county here in Northern Arizona where I could turn that those those a thousand dollars very quickly into twenty thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's just great. Just with direct mail, you know. Uh, oh, I love it. I love it. Well, I you know I could keep you on forever. I wish we didn't have the clock, unfortunately, but uh, we'll just have to have you back. That's what we'll have to do here. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, we uh, I'm sure there's a lot of folks here that like to learn out more about you and how to reach you or find out what you do and uh, what, what's sort of the best way for folks to to find out more about what you do and and uh, how can people get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, like I said earlier, there is this Facebook uh, community that we are very proud. We've built over the last four years of, uh, of generous people with their time and knowledge. It's a free group. We're all land flippers in there. It's about 6,700 people in that group every day with amazing successes, you know, really encouraging each other, um, you know, making sure that we're all online, uh, that we get in line and we stay in line kind of thing. That's something that we say. Um, and, and really sharing their, their struggles, their successes, helping each other, everyone that is, you know, a few steps ahead, helping the ones behind. So that would be a free resource and that group is land profit generator real estate investing group on facebook if you just plug in on facebook uh land profit generator um you will probably um come to us and of course i'm also on facebook michelle bosch i'm on instagram michelle bosch official i'm also a host of a podcast it's called in flow and i you know part of my purpose now is getting many more ladies into real estate um, and so it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it, you know, it's a uh, dedicated, my audience is, is, is women there. Uh, but of course what I'm sharing there is timeless wisdom that is, you know, for everyone pretty much. Um, we also host uh, another podcast, my husband and I called the Farber cash podcast. So many ways to get a hold of us. Um, but I would say land profit generator, real estate investing group, that'd be a great place or the website landprofitgenerator.com. Great. And we will have, we have real extensive show notes. So we'll have links to all those in our show notes. So people can just go right there. Just click on it. Yeah. 
Well, this has been great having you on, Michelle. Uh, this has been just w- a wealth of information. I am just fascinated here with this story. And uh, we have a tradition here with our guests, too. Uh, everyone closes us out with their best old hound dog howl. And I understand you have a, 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 a corgi, right? So, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a seven pound yorgi, so I will try uh, yorgi, to sorry, Daisy. Corgi. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you can give us your best old corgi uh, howl here. <laughs> okay, so here it goes. On count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> That's <was> great. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Well, thank you, Michelle, so much for joining us. Thank it's you been so a much, blast. Bill. It was a pleasure. It was a it was a wonderful time. It was a time well lived. So thank you so much for your time and for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And I want to thank all our old dog listeners out there too for joining us. I know there's a lot of other folks that a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we really appreciate it. Please note everything presented here today everything michelle talked about and all the links as well can be accessed in our detailed show notes on the old dogs website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog and you're going to look for the episode with michelle bosch well that's the show for today remember cash flow is king and real estate investing the means until next time keep moving forward and may god bless thank you very much for visiting the old dogs rei network We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.